Hi, everybody. Um, I'm really honoured to be here and um, quite overwhelmed to be the first speaker, but I'll do my best to explain my study. Um, I'm here on behalf of um, Kunle Oyeri and Anthony Williams that are also part of the study. And we're looking at wearable uh, neuroimaging and emotion, and particularly investigating resp emotional responses to architectural environments with functional near-infrared spectroscopy. So just as a background for me, I've been uh, practicing architect for over 10 years now. Um, and been involved in some fairly big architecture. Um, I co-designed a natatorium in Nanjing and also, would you believe it, a rodeo pavilion in, um, in Australia, which was quite a fun project to work on. Currently, I'm a lecturer at QUT and I teach into architecture and interior design and just recently, um, part of the executive committee of the Design and Emotion Society um, that's launched in Australia. As part of this research, we've been involved with Vision Australia, which is an uh, organisation that helps people with blindness and low vision. And I'll talk a bit more about that um, as I go on. And also uh, working with uh, research in the Institute of Health and Biomedical Innovation, and particularly researchers that engage with NIRS um, to understand how the brain operates in terms of rehabilitative re rehabilita um, processes, and that's with both Graham Kerr and Kunle Olieri. So the key questions that I guess the study is about is, can the effective qualities of architectural environments be quantifiably investigated using non-invasive neuroimaging in real time? So walking through real space. And if that is the case, which regions within the brain are activated during these processes? And how can they inform architectural research and practice? I have to also say that we're at the initial stages of this study, so there's no data that I can show you, but I can walk you through how we've structured the study um, to open up discussion around using NIRS for this research. So what's really key for me is a strong interest in the vision impaired. Um, and I was talking to a vision impaired artist just the other week, and she referred to herself as a VIP. And I think that's quite apt because I think that they're very important people for us to um, engage with and learn from in terms of their spatial perception and how they sense space. This is Brendan Borolini, um, and we're working together um, in 2015 on a project called FELT, which looks at artists that are visually impaired and um, artists that are sighted to see what kind of co-learning can be developed through the project. And Brendan is quite remarkable because he's not only blind, but also deaf. Um, but to understand further his world, he's also a um, photographic artist. So he goes out into the environment and takes photos of his surroundings. And then with um, digital technology and um, laser jet printing, he brings his world closer to himself by understanding what that space um, is like um, that space that evokes some kind of deeper meaning for him. And it's that understanding and awareness that I think that I would, we, we are interested in tapping into um, and exploring for this project. There's a lot of research about the vision impaired and particularly about how um, we can understand how they navigate space, um, but there's less so research in terms of how spaces affect the visually impaired and how they sense that effect and how that information can actually contribute to our understanding of space. Um, there are a few researchers that have looked at this um, and they talk about um, the vision impaired uh, sensing space and feeling kind of oppressive qualities within space. Um, Rebecca Maxwell 
was interviewed by Saunders um, through an ABC program in 2004, and she said, a low ceiling, um, with a low ceiling she feels a sense of oppression. She said, I can't be geometrically accurate about that, but there are proportions that are comfortable and proportions that aren't, and the ceiling height is an important part of it. She goes on to say that an air-conditioned building feels dead and it becomes amorphous, too homogenous, and that even the size of the space is lost. So I think that's quite a powerful kind of statement to make because in our sighted world we are very dominated by our visual capacity and that by understanding those sensitivities into um, research that we can find deeper understanding of how we actually respond to space. Another reason why I guess I pulled out this quote is because, as we know for our architects, that we work to um, standards of regulation and legislation, and often standards like building height are set by things other than just health. And I guess that's a focus of my inquiry. Why do we, what is the level that is optimum or are there any levels that are optimum for our spatial um, presence and our emotion within space? So there's a lot of research that talks about the visually impaired and how they have the ability to, to describe qualities of space, particularly interior space, and how that spatial effect um, can cause them different states of emotion. And how they do that through deductive reasoning and spatial imagery, not just from an allocentric position, as in um, how they perceive from their body, but also in developing imaginative maps that understand their position within space. Um, also, there's literature about how early blind participants are observed to perform as well as sighted due to their higher auditory and somatosensory spatial acuity. So because of their lack of sight, their other senses are in tune, as it were, and provide them with um, sufficient information. So this is a remarkable quality, um, and it's through um, abilities such as sound shadow, shadows or echolocation or even face vision, which is a kind of a skin a response to um, environments and um, people, phenomena within the world. So to get on to uh, NEARS or functional near infrared spectroscopy, I guess what is it? It's an optical method to measure blood oxygenation within the brain as an indicator of activity within the brain. So when we have a thought or we have an, uh, a feeling or an act or when we use our body, that creates neural firing within particular regions of the brain. And scientists have been investigating the correlation between the neural firing and the amount of oxygenation that occurs due to that instance. So near-infrared spectroscopy um, has the ability to detect either oxygenation or deoxygenation, which is key to different kinds of states that people experience. Um, near infrared is non-invasive. It's very similar to the EEG that we just saw previously. Um, it's wearable. There are issues with it, um, as with EEG. Um, but it's currently being used in medical procedures, psychiatry, psychology, um, cognition studies, rehabilitation, even tissue research, and more recently, neuromarketing to understand how we perceive things in our environment. Now, there are problems with near infrared spectroscopy, and it's perhaps one of the reasons why it hasn't been used more broadly, although I think that's rapidly changing. And it's because um, in order to get the reflectance of light, um, the, the uh, detectors and optodes are spaced um, at particular spacings, and that provides only minimum in, um, intrusion within the brain. So you only get a 25 centimetre depth into the brain. 
So that's problematic in terms of researching emotion where that emotion is actually focused or seated deep within the brain centres. But there's been a lot of research, particularly coming out of Tokyo, that looks at how you can actually detect emotion through the prefrontal cortex. Um, and I'll just go through some of the progression um, just lately in the last 20 years. And particularly through um, Hoshi, who's been um, a key leader in near-infrared spectroscopy. And early on, she looked at the use of near-infrared through um, brain imaging um, to detect different types of behaviours and tasks. And probably the second paper that she presented, um, she noted that near-infrared spectroscopy had the ability to kind of uh, provide events where, or provide data where there was a high emotional um, stress that um, a participant was experiencing. And that was found to increase the oxygenation of the blood in the the um, lateral frontal cortex of the brain. And she thought that was quite interesting and she produced a lot of other research. Um, she's looked at Wi-Fi technology with NIRS and again looking at fear emotion and how that is evaluated or how that transpires through the brain. And in this study in 2001, she saw an increase again in oxygenation of the blood within the frontal cortex. And then in 2011, she returned back to um, looking at emotion and NIRS. Um, she's published a lot through psychiatry over the years, but I suspect that this has been something that's been in the back of her mind and she, she uh, is keen to explore it more further. In this 2011 study, she looked at, uh, it was an effective study looking at images um, that created unpleasant, pleasant and neutral emotions within participants. And she found a high increase in oxygenation of the blood in the ventral lateral prefrontal cortex. So others have gone on to explore NIRS in terms of auditory um, emotion or the auditory effects upon emotion. Um, that includes Plicta in 2011 that looked at activation of the auditory cortex and whether you could perceive that with NIRS. And particularly Asano um, last year, who used effective sounds to actually, um, and NIRS, to understand whether people could communicate or could, we could understand how people were feeling with no capacity to talk or communicate. And they found that there was an indication of blood change within the frontal cortex that activated particular areas um, associated with negative and positive emotion. So just as a kind of overview, and I'm not a neuroscientist, but I'm coming up to speed with this <coughs> very quickly with my professors. Um, the prefrontal cortex and the anterior anterior cingulate cortex are associated, they kind of talk to one another and they're associated with the cognition and the regulation of emotion. Um, the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, which is within this area, this is a slice of the brain, which this is the front of the brain, and this is the rear. Um, and these numbers represent Boca's um, areas associated with different um, qualities or senses or activities. Sorry. Um, so the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex is associated with recognition of emotions, spatial memory, non-speech sounds. And the orbital frontal prefrontal cortex has been associated with really subtle feelings, um, such as sadness and negative emotions. So this is a, a current model of near-infrared spectroscopy. Um, it's been produced by NIRX, and it's lightweight, it's wearable, it has 64 channels that measures the complete um, EEG cap um, brain areas. Um, it measures blood rates at real time, 
and shows the different types of oxygenation and deoxygenation rates. And it's got mobile capacity. So how are we going to set up our study? We're going to use and invite congenitally blind people with the near infrared spectroscopy into a stationary study, which is looking at just a very basic room formation and give them effective spatial survey and anagram word task. And the second study is pretty much the same, but it's actually a motion study moving through a corridor space. We're doing this because it's based on previous studies that have been undertaken. One associated with um, participants understanding or relating sensing space to particular words. Um, so high ceiling heights were related to freedom related words and low ceiling heights related to confinement related words. And a second study that relates um, the vision impaired and their ability to de detect space whilst in motion. So we're going to map each of those studies using um, near infrared spectroscopy as an adaptation. So as an outcome, what we're trying to understand is whether this study will be beneficial and whether we have better understanding of the vision impaired and how they sense space. And perhaps um, further on, how we can use that information to, to propose a taxonomy of space and effect and kind of question um, the experience of space and even classical notions of proportion and harmony that we talk about a lot in architecture. Thank you. <laughs>